Welcome everybody to our little Bible study and today we will be covering Colossians chapter 1 and um, let's start with a word of prayer but let me just show you my little my little visual today. Uh, I'm going to use this to help us to um, understand the two times that Paul mentions firstborn in um, verse 15 of chapter 1. So we're going to get to that in a little bit. Um, dear Holy Father God, we praise you and thank you um, for um, your word. And we praise you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and all that he's done for us on the cross, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We thank you that we have put all of our faith in him and in um the King James Bible, Rightly Divided, and that's our final authority, and we pray that you would help us all to have spiritual understanding as we look into your word today, and that this advanced doctrine would stabilize us and advance us in our understanding and in our edification and our spiritual growth, and also those who watch us. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus name. Okay. So, um, Colossians chapter 1, if you'll look here um, on the board, um, is um, Christ's fullness and preeminence declared. Um, verses 1 through 12 in the gospel message. So, his fullness and preeminence is declared in the gospel message. Um, 13 through 14. Uh, those verses in the cross. Its preeminence is declared in the cross. 15 through 17, the firstborn of every creature and from the dead. 18 through 23, Christ is the head of the church. And 24 through 29, there's only 29 verses, Paul's ministry of the mystery of Christ. So Colossians is a letter of correction. Uh, for not uh, for deviation he doesn't want them to deviate from the advanced doctrine that's in the Ephesians um, no passage in the Bible sets forth the eternal glory of the pre-existent omnipotent exalted and eternal Son of God than verses 15 through 23 in chapter 1 of Colossians what does Paul mean uh, by Christ being the firstborn of every creature in verse 15. And what does um, Paul mean by Christ being the firstborn from the dead in verse 18? So we're going to answer those questions right from the beginning because we want to put the cookies on the bottom shelf so everyone can have the most important information from the very beginning. Okay, so... Let's move on. Um, and so, this you want on fully? No, no, the, uh, yeah, they can have um, as long as I'm in it, true. Okay, oh, so we're going through an edification process and um, in the uh, prison epistles. And so in our first uh, book in the prison epistles was um, the Red Ring, <laughs> that will be Ephesians. Our next book was the Philippians, the book to the Philippians, and then now we're in the yellow ring, which is Colossians, and then we will do Philemon, um, and then we'll be done with the edification process in the prison epistles. But now I want to explain the edification process. Um, it can you can view the edifice or building of sound doctrine as a two-story house with Romans being our basic and foundational doctrine and first and second Corinthians and Galatians making up the walls then the next level of doctrine is Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians make up the walls then um, on top of that is the roof of the you know, coming up Christ, 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians make up the roof. 
and that's about our, you know, his coming to get us, to rapture us. So, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, and Philemon are letters of how to live in that house. Mm -hmm. And then um, the goal is to consider what I, Paul, says, and the Lord give you, give the understanding in all things. So that's 2 Timothy 2.7. So our goal is that if we understand Paul's epistle, then we will be better equipped to understand all of the Bible. Okay. So this one will come down. And we don't want it to come down. There, stay. So just a quick um, reminder of what happens at salvation is that um, when we trust what the Lord Jesus Christ has done uh, and who he is, the Son of God, um, and put our faith in that, then God's Spirit, okay, so man is made up, okay, of spirit, soul, and body. And when we trust what Christ has done, his spirit comes into our spirit, and we who were dead spiritually become spiritually alive. Mm -hmm. Then um, at that time also, our soul that was dark becomes light, and God cuts between our body and our soul a spiritual circumcision so that we are no longer ruled by the sinful flesh in our body and so our depraved body will be replaced at the rapture with a glorified body mm. so that's uh, pretty much what happens at salvation and I just want you to have that in your mind so the thing let's see if we can get this to stay okay got it the theme of, of um, Colossians is the fullness and preeminence of Christ. It's correction for the error of not holding the head, as it says in 2.19. A letter written by Paul to stabilize and advance the saints at Colossae. And so it's going to do the same for us. It's going to stabilize us, and it's going to advance us. The outline could be one, two, three, okay? Three Ds. So, number one, the doctrine. Number two, danger. And number three, duty. So, doctrine is Christ's fullness and preeminence is declared. And the key verse, and he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. So in um, that's chapter 1. Then danger will be in chapter 2. The danger is Christ's preeminence is defended. And next week I'll give you the key verse for chapter 2. Then the next part, number 3, is duty. Preeminence displayed in a worthy walk. And I'll give you that key verse next uh, after that. And that's chapters 3 and 4. Okay. I don't want my lose my tree. I want to lose it. Okay. So, <clears throat> I'm going to hold up right here. To show you where Colossians is. Uh oh. Patty, I don't have my glasses. I think I left them either on the kitchen table or in the bathroom. <laughs> okay. So Colossians, uh, uh, Colossi, Laodicea. Oh, no, I have to have mine. Um, Colossi, Laodicea, and Hierapolis are three little cities that were within 10 miles of each other um, in Asia Minor. And that they were about a hundred miles east of um, Ephesus. So, um, sorry you missed that, Patty. Let me go over it again. Okay. Okay. So, Ephesus is a hundred. Um, Colossi is a hundred miles east 
mm-hmm. of, of Ephesus, mm-hmm. and, and there's a tr- three cities that are within 10 miles of each other. Laodicea and Hierapolis are, are there also. So, <clears throat> the first thing we're going to do so, <laughs> is I want to I want to show this now so I don't forget it. Okay. okay. When we um, talk about being translated, we're going to be translated out of darkness into the light. So, out of Adam into Jesus Christ. Okay? So, it just keep that in your mind. And um, now I'm going to answer the first question. I mean, the last question first, which is, what does it mean when we say that Jesus Christ is the firstborn of the dead? Okay? So if you follow me with your cameras, um, we're going to go over here to um, before the foundations of the world. Um, the Godhead had a plan that was hidden in the Father that no one learned about until Paul was saved on the road to Damascus. So, uh, this here is a map that follows the books of the Bibles from Genesis to Revelation. And um, this first part is prophecy. Then comes mystery, the yellow part, and then comes prophecy again, the white part. But this is how our Bibles are laid out. So um, if we can imagine a parenthesis like this, the beginning of the parenthesis is when Christ from heaven saves Paul on the road to Damascus, and he made him the first person in the body of Christ and the, his apostle to the one body of Christ his one one apostle and he is going to have the job of um, building the body of Christ in the dispensation of God's grace then the other part of the parentheses is uh, the next appearing so Christ appeared to Paul on that road and the next appearing will be to the body of Christ who catches up at the rapture. So everyone who is living in the yellow part are going to live in the heavenly places because God, in the beginning, he created the heaven and the earth. He has two realms, and everyone in the yellow part that was saved during the dispensation of grace will live in heavenly places, and the rest of the people in the white part on both sides will live in the kingdom on earth with the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's rightly dividing the word of God. That's following 2 Timothy 2.15. So another way of looking at this is prophecy, mystery, prophecy, or time past, but now, ages to come. So this is how the Bible is laid out. And if you rightly divide the word of truth, um, which usually cannot be done, it cannot be done with the uh, modern Bibles, but it can be with the King James Bible. So that is a a very good reason to use the King James Bible. So you can understand how God divides his word. Because it's not how we divide it, it's how he divides it. And without understanding that, you will not be able to understand the Bible. So now we're going to talk about Christ being the the firstborn of the dead. Okay? So when Adam and Eve sinned um, by eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and disobeying God, God had to have them leave the Garden of Eden because there was another tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of life. And if they had eaten of that other tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of life, they would have lived eternally in their fallen state. So God made sure that they got out of the garden and couldn't get to that tree. So um, during all of this time, 
um, there was some people that were raised from the dead. So uh, let's talk about some of those people who were raised from the dead. There was Elijah raised the widow of Seraphat's son from the dead. And then Elisha raised the Shunammans, the, the lady of Shunamm, uh, son from the dead. But those um, sons eventually died. Then um, there are other incidents of being raised from the dead, such as um, when they threw someone into the grave of Elisha and he touched Elisha's bones, that person regained, revived and came alive again. And um, so we also know that Christ, when he was on earth, he raised um, three people from the dead. It was uh, the widow's son uh, from Nain, and he raised the little girl that was, um, belonged to Jairus, and he also raised Lazarus from the dead. Remember Lazarus come forth? Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Lazarus was raised from the dead, but what happened to Lazarus eventually is he died mm -hmm. again. So the firstborn from the dead was Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, you know what happened? He, he had so much power that several people were also came out of their tombs and Several brethren, several believers came alive during, you know, when Christ rose. But all of those believers in Jerusalem, they died again. But Christ, because he, what you can see here, he died on the cross. And, and then he was buried. And then he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, because the Father raised him. And so it was amazing. Uh, what is that, Maureen? Um, just if you used your left hand, then we could capture you. Oh, okay. Did you use my left missed. hand? Yeah. Okay. Yes, we kind of right. missed. So anyway, um, when Christ rose, he rose in a glorified eternal body that will never die again. So he has the preeminence. See? He was the firstborn of all um, people from the dead in a glorified body. Because when Adam and Eve were made, they had eternal bodies that were not meant to die, but they didn't have glorified bodies, okay? And that's why, um, you know, we have Christ being the firstborn from the dead. So he was the firstborn in a glorified body and other people will have glorified bodies if they have trusted in Jesus Christ as their um, Savior. So in during um, our dispensation. So everyone who has believed 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, which said that Christ died for our, in the body of Christ's sins, and was buried and rose again the third day, will have a glorified body at the rapture when he appears. And so we'll... You know, follow after because someone who's firstborn, that means if you're first, there's more to follow. Mm -hmm. So during the dispensation of grace, there are Jews and Gentiles, all people have an opportunity to trust what Christ has done and be saved. Anyone can, no matter how bad they've been, and um, say and be saved by trusting what Christ has done. So Gentiles are being saved. Uh, because even the Jews are considered Gentiles during our dispensation of grace. But Gentiles have also been saved in, the, in prophecy. We know, you know, for example, Ruth was saved. So um, when um, we are gone, see, during the dispensation of grace, this 70th week of Daniel, the seven years of tri tribulation, God is long-suffering because he's holding that back. Our dispensation is holding back that wrath, that seven-year wrath, to come on Jacob's trouble. So um, once that wrath has been, because Israel needs to be purified and punished because of their spiritual adultery, 
-hmm. Once uh, he's going to have a believing remnant, though, that trusts in him, and then at his second coming, he's going to uh, restore the earth, and there will be, be a lot of people that will be okay. So here, were, here was us. We were raptured, right? Okay. And then so when he comes in his second coming and set up his kingdom, he's going to rapture uh, the 12 tribes. And he's going to um, have, you know, I mean, resurrect, not rapture, resurrect. Resurrect the 12 tribes. He's going to resurrect Abraham. He's going to resurrect Ruth. You know, so they'll be in glorified bodies then. But... The Gentiles that are saved in the kingdom will not have glorified bodies. So, because there's going to be, um, Satan is going to be in the bottomless pit for a thousand years, and then he's going to be re-released after that first thousand year reign of Christ. And when he does that, he will draw many Gentiles after himself, and these Gentiles will surround the beloved city, of Jerusalem and um, want to fight against the king and his kingdom and God from heaven will send fire and snuff them all out mm. and just like that so those people will all die and then God will know which of the Gentiles have been loyal to him and those Gentiles after um, the judgment seat of Christ will of the lost will happen and those Gentiles will be able then in the new Jerusalem that has that will come down um, to eat from the tree of life. The tree of life that was way back there in the Garden of Eden will be in the new Jerusalem and the leaves will be for the healing of the nations and those Gentiles will then be able to get their glorified bodies by eating from that tree. And that tree will be in the new Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Uh -huh. All right, so now we've talked about how Christ is the firstborn from the dead. Now I want to talk a little bit about how he's the firstborn of um, every creature. Okay, so um, he's the firstborn of every creature is, um, means that he is the heir of all things, heir of all creation, because we know that we're joint heirs with Christ, so it's important for us to know what you know, what does Christ have? What, does, what is he heir of? Mm -hmm. You know, so that we'll know what we get to share with him. So he's um, the heir of all creation. Um, he's the first, he was, he was before anything was made. And remember that Adam is called the son of God in the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew 1. But now, um, because he disobeyed God, Jesus Christ will be the son of God. He will be the one who inherits the double blessing. Because the firstborn son gets the double blessing. Now, there's a, a, a picture of this in the Bible where it says that Reuben... He went up to his father's bed, and so he uh, lost his birthright. He lost a double portion, which then went to Joseph, the firstborn son that Jacob had with um, um, uh, Rachel. So um, Joseph has, you know, the Manasseh and Ephraim, the two tribes. And, and so they, he gets two. He gets two tribes to um, it, of his progeny to um, be in the kingdom. So um, like in a similar way to, uh, to Joseph, Jesus is now going to have the double per portion. He's going to be the heir of all creation. He will have, you know, preeminence in all things. And... Um, Creation was subject to the fall. It was when uh, God cursed, um, you know, uh, Satan, the serpent, and he also cursed the ground. So he cursed, cursed creation. We're living in a sin-cursed world now. We're living in a present evil world. Um, and God is not working with us in, in physical blessings. But So creation... 
because Adam sinned, creation was innocent, and creation fell, and creation has been groaning, waiting to be restored. So God will make the, the um, earth much better during the kingdom, but it won't be, com you know, completely perfect and renewed like it will be after it, the earth is burnt up and, mm -hmm. and the heavens pass away. There'll be a new renovated heaven and earth. And that's when everything, only believers will live in those two places. Okay? So let's get on with our study. If you'll join me um, on, and turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. Um, let's uh, have Maureen read our first uh, verse. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother. So Paul identifies himself, then he gives his position, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Paul appointed, it was appointed as the exclusive apostle to the body of Christ by the will of God. Paul is not the 13th apostle, but the one apostle to the one body of Christ. The entire King James Bible will make sense once we realize that Paul is our only apostle for today and that his letters are addressed to and about us, while the rest of the Bible is for our understanding and our learning. This letter was most likely dictated to Timothy, who is mentioned here in the greeting, who wrote it down and Paul signed it. Uh, verse 2 uh, Patty? To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul writes to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ. Notice how it says in Christ, which are at Colossae. The Father and Lord Jesus Christ are offering grace and peace to anyone who believes in Christ's fully satisfying sacrifice for their sins and his resurrection and dispensation of grace. That's why they say grace and peace. That's a dispensational um, greeting. Mm -hmm. That's what God is offering because he's not sending his wrath, right? Mm -hmm. He's holding back the trip. Grace and pre peace have to do with what God is doing today. It is a dispensational declaration. Salvation is what Christ has done and is based on his merit alone, not on anything we have done or do. We just believe and receive his imputed righteousness. We look to the cross to know that God loved us. Even when we were sinners, Christ died for us. Um, verse 3, Maureen. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Paul prays along with his co-workers, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks for the Colossian saints. As mature saints and, um, and uh, the apostle uh, uh, Paul prayed to others in the body of Christ. So mature saints, we should pray for others, not just ourselves. Paul's greatest desire since he was arrested by the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus which is mentioned in Acts 9, 22, and 26, was to exalt and magnify him, uh, the Lord. In Philippians, we learned that Paul had found a new love that had captivated him, and he was living a Christ-intoxicating life. He wanted to win, know, and apprehend the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. So, notice in Philippians 3 8 how it says the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord that is all of Romans to Philemon all the 13 chapters the doctrine that's for the body of Christ that is the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus our Lord so our goal is what our goal is to fully understand those 13 letters and what's going to happen if we do we're going to understand the rest of the Bible better by knowing him more deeply through his word, by identifying with him to a greater degree, is what Paul wanted to do in Philippians. Because I always wondered, you know, 
if uh, Colossians and, and Ephesians, Ephesians and Colossians are sister epistles, um, where Colossians is a deviation from the norm, and they complement and augment each other, why did God choose to insert Philippians between the two epistles? Mm -hmm. And so I finally came to think, um, I know why, is that in Philippians, Paul says that I, he wants to know Christ. And, you know, we're going to really learn about how Paul knew and magnified Christ in this in Colossians. So it kind of fits. So um, Paul wanted to be conformed to Christ's image and have him living in him 100% of the time, which, you know, it's very hard to do. Christ is the price. He counted his previous life as dung. He said, I don't live there anymore. That is no longer who I am in Christ. Mm -hmm. He was translated out of Adam into Christ, and he went from having one father to having another father. From seeing, seeming victory as a, a Pharisee to true victory. Saul, also known as Paul, thought that he was persecuting Christ's followers, but was startled and shocked to learn that when he was really persecuting the Lord. Mm -hmm. So um, the Lord said, why are you persecuting me, right? Mm -hmm. And so when someone is persecuting the Lord's people, they're really persecuting him. Mm -hmm. Paul went from persecuting Christ to total dedication to Christ when he was apprehended by him on that road to Damascus. Uh, Patty, verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. Okay, so their love to all the saints and their faith in Jesus Christ was evidence, you know, because those are fruits of the Spirit that you know, these saints at Colossae were, you know, in the right Pauline message. Probably what had happened was that um, Epaphras was one of Paul's students at, at Ephesus. During his three years in Ephesus, he, he taught at the school of Tyrannus for two years. So Epaphras was probably one of those students that then went um, to, as a missionary evangelist to Colossae, Hierapolis, and Laodicea, and help them to come to the Lord. Then, um, you know, Epaphras was probably uh, ministering there under the guidance of Paul. So, um, on his visit, so he came to visit Paul in Rome. Epaphras came to visit uh, Paul in Rome. And Epaphras gave him an overall glowing report of the Colossians' faith and love. And um, their orderly conduct. But he also anxiously told Paul about the appealing heretics who wanted to entice the believers there to be moved away from Paul's sound words of truth by vain philosophies. Love Faith and love is our fr fruits of the spirits, and which prove that they had uh, the spirit of Christ in them. Galatians 5.22 talks about the fruits. Their love knit them together, as we is mentioned in 2.20, no, 2.2. And when we get to chapter 2, we'll see that. Charity is the love that like-minded Pauline believers display for each other. As with Romans, there is no indication that Paul visited Colossae prior to writing this letter, as we'll see in the next chapter. From all indications, he had never visited that city, but was acquainted with the saints through their minister, Epaphras. However, Paul wrote to Philemon, who had a church in his home at Colossae, and said he planned to visit him after his release from prison. Philemon's son... Archippus was the pastor of the church that was in his home. 
Paul probably went there after his release from house arrest, which is after this letter was written. Um, verse 5, Maureen. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Okay, so you can see there that he talks about the hope laid up in heaven, which is the rapture, right? And uh, being there, and also because they heard the word of truth of the gospel. So uh, once they heard the gospel message, they were saved. And it wasn't, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about all that. So our hope is to be a habitation of God. That's our high calling in the heavenly part of the household of God, his holy temple, the whole family. So the kingdom of God is really made up of two realms, heaven and earth. And so our part is the heavenly part. The Colossians had been saved by hearing the word of truth of the gospel. It is scripture that can cut between a person's soul and spirit into their heart and mind. Therefore, whenever possible, quote God's word to others accurately, not your own words. Ask them if they believe how, by crucifixion, um, Christ died for our sins, as um, that's our there is the members of the body of Christ, us, um, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Do you believe that? You can say, I believe that. Do you believe that? However, it's important to use the term gospel uh, to know. It's important to know that the term gospel, glad tidings or good news, also means all the doctrine that Paul received from Christ to and about the body of Christ, which is Romans to Philemon, those 13 epistles. The rest of scripture is not directly to us, but contains much information that we need to know, and there are some parallels that apply to us. And I just want to say that I'm very happy that Cheryl is joining Maureen and Patty and I today. And she is one of my first assistants and a very long time good friend. Mm -hmm. uh, Patty, verse 6. Which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. Okay, so the, the gospel, um, the sound doctrine that Paul uh, got, uh, received from Christ in heaven that has been relayed to these people in Colossae from Epaphras is working in these saints. The, the word of God works in us effectually in those who have the spirit of God in them to help them to understand it. They had the fruit of saved saints and the fruit of the Spirit in their lives. The gospel will do, uh, will work to produce the fruit of the Spirit if believers rightly divide and follow the sound doctrine God gave to Paul. Salvation, justification, comes by believing, uh, but right living, spiritual growth, sanctification, comes from Bible study. Okay? You might, you, you, you will never grow unless you study the Bible. And you can listen to someone that's teaching the Bible, but you also need to do your own personal Bible study because both of them help. So the gospel had spread in all the world. And see how it says there? Which is come to unto you as it is in all the world. Okay? Mm -hmm. But Jesus, while on earth, said, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Okay? So when Paul preached this almost 2,000 years ago, had, did the end come? No. No. The end has not come. So why not? Paul's because, salvation. Because... God inserted the dispensation of grace. He interrupted prophecy and inserted the mystery and will resume prophecy after the rapture. So blindness has come to the nation of Israel. 
uh, at this time, in part. So there are, you know, parts that can be saved into the body of Christ if they believe um, a Paul's uh, gospel. The Bible is laid out, like I said, prophecy, mystery, prophecy. God isn't finished with Israel yet. Gentiles will also be saved in the prophecy program, but the Gentiles um, will be, those Gentiles that are saved in Israel's program will be their servants. Turn to Isaiah 49, 22. Isaiah 49, 22. The first one there can read it. Okay, who's got Isaiah 49, 22? Sure. I got it. Okay, go ahead, Lori. Or, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles, and set up my standard to the people, and they shall bring thy sons in thy arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. Okay, see? They're going to be like their, the nursemaids, for their children, okay? Their servants, you know, kind of like governesses, taking care of the, the children that belong to the Jews. Um, there's many other scriptures, but this is, suffices to make my point. Christ is the centerpiece of our faith, love, and hope. I want you to notice that in Colossians chapter 1, he has just mentioned faith in verse 4. Love also in verse 4 and hope in verse 5. So you see that? Faith, hope, and love. Faith, love, and hope are in those two verses. Our hope is to live with him in heaven. Paul declared Christ's word of truth to us. He wrote, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me, Paul, to you word in Ephesians 3, 2. So the dispensation of the grace of God that we're living in was given to Paul to you word, which is the Gentiles, uh, believers. The truth is that we are living in the dispensation of Grace, a time of amnesty when God is long suffering, holding back the tribulation, Jacob's trouble, as it says in Jeremiah 30, verse 7, until after the rapture, as it says in 1 Thessalonians 1 10 and 5 9. Christ died for our, the Gentiles, sins, um, <clears throat> so that we can have a be saved directly by faith in Him and live in heaven apart from the law and apart from having to be saved by blessing Israel. Um, during the prophecy program, they will have to bless Israel, as it says in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Um, Patty, verse 7. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear self fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, Epaphras also included a letter, see, that you also learned from him, to the Colossians that he wrote and was delivered by Tychicus and Anismus, as it was saying in Colossians 4, 7 through 9. Paul calls him a dear fellow servant and their faithful minister in Christ. Paul spoke highly of him to them. He had also alerted Paul to some false teachers who had come into that church. So Paul is writing this letter to correct false doctrine that is not in accordance with the advanced sound doctrine taught in Ephesians. The main problem being that they were not holding the head, as we'll see in verse 2-9 of the body of Christ. Um, eight, Marie. Who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. This is the only time the Holy Spirit is mentioned in this epistle. See how it says spirit? Paul makes it clear that the Colossians are demonstrating love by the spirit working in them. The living God uses his living word to work in us. The spirit needs verses. The spirit that lives in us needs verses. We are diverse, but we have oneness or unity in Christ because we all have the spirit of Christ in us, as we're going to learn today. 
Paul waits and begins with their good point before tactfully correcting the false doctrine which was trying to creep into the church. We should follow Paul's example when we correct someone. Maureen, can you read from 9 to 12? We're going to take a big chunk. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Okay, so Maureen is reading our, uh, Paul's prayer. This is what they're praying for the Colossians. Keep going. So spiritual understanding was one. Keep going. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Good reading. For this cause is the faith, their faith in Christ Jesus and love for each other in verse since the moment Paul heard of their faith, he and Epaphras, Timothy, and others have not ceased to pray for them. The desires of Paul's prayers was four things. So, one, he may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Okay, so one of the... Um, Heretic's favorite terms was filled and fullness. So Paul uses it a lot in rebutting and refuting their um, tactics. So that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. How are we going to be filled with the knowledge of his will and, 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 and have spiritual understanding? The word. By reading and studying his word. Paul knew that Satan attacks the minds and did not want these saints to fall into the Galatian error of mixing Peter and Paul, law and grace, Christ's earthly ministry with Christ's ministry from heaven, which is so prevalent today. Almost all, uh, you know, more, almost like 99% of Christian churches mix law and grace, Peter and Paul today. And it's the Galatian error. They are in error. So Paul prays for their spiritual understanding. Satan wasted no time in having the Judaizers come in behind Paul in the Galatian churches to pervert the gospel of grace, mixing it with legalism, as it said in Galatians 1, 6 through 8. The Corinthians had been puffed up with their temporary, divinely given knowledge Temporary sign gifts and human wisdom, as it says in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, 8, 1, 13, 8 through 13. Uh, the, uh, God's will is uh, to, in the future, gather together into one believers in heaven and earth. The mystery of his will, we're talking about what's the will of God, okay? Okay. Is the, um, the mystery of his will, according to his will, good pleasure which he has purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times which is the dispensation after after the next on out here that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him that will be his one big kingdom so that's in ephesians 1 9 and 10 see how it says here 1 10 on the oh, yes. board. Mm -hmm. So that's a dispensation of fullness of time. God also will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's his um, primary will in the dispensation of grace. As it says in 1 Timothy 2, 4. For all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. So we're helping with that today. Paul told the Corinthians that if Satan had known that Christ would redeem not only the earth, but also the heavenly places, that Satan would not have allowed the crucifixion to occur. 
But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. So those princes are those in a, you know, wicked principalities in Ephesians 6, 12. The rulers of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. So the princes of this world are empowered by Satan and are wicked. Remember, Paul had a father before he was saved? Who was that father? Satan. Satan, right. We all had that same father before we were saved. He had Satan, mm -hmm. which is also called the prince of the power in the air. We'll see more of that later. So, um, for having known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8. So we're taking, we're talking about the four points of the prayer. We just talked about spiritual understanding, okay? Now we're going to talk about the second part of the prayer. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. So we are to walk worthy of the Lord and pleasing to others. Grace is not a license to sin. We do that quite well on our own. Grace saves us from the penalty and power of sin so we can choose to live a pleasing, fruitful life full of good works for God in spirit. Paul wants believers to continue to increase in the knowledge of God. Knowing what God says and to whom he says it is rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. Now, here's the third part to the prayer. Strengthen with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. God's power is not manifesting itself in amazing miracles, but in acceptance of expected suffering, trouble, and persecution today. We cannot live the grace life in our own strength. We need the power of Christ, as mentioned in 2 Corinthians 9.12. The life that of Jesus is in us, as it says in Galatians 2.20. His might, we have his might as part of our armor, as it says in Ephesians 6.10. And we have his strength in Philippians 1.19 and 4.13. His spirit in us uses his spiritually discerned word to work effectually in us who believe. We need his patience, his willingness to suffer over a long period of time, and his joyfulness. I have been praying for someone for 26 years, but he still refuses to um, uh, read the Bible. And he enjoys watching TV much better. And I know that many of you can relate to having prayed for someone for many, many years. So that's, you know, long suffering <laughs> on a small scale. It is best when helping someone to use I statements. Um, and to admit our shortcomings. We can say, you know, before I was saved, I didn't know this. Before I came to right dividing, I didn't know that. If we lose our patience, then we may lose our relationship with that person and our effectiveness to be a blessing to them. I know because I have lost my patience on a rare occasion. Very rare, very rare. rare. <laughs> <laughs> and I regretted it. We want them to be saved and to come to knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2.4 Paul preached an unpopular message. It said that Christ had already done it all. Our flesh wants to contribute to our salvation so it can glory. We only contribute the, the sin that made it necessary for Christ to take the nail for us. We were born sinners, Romans 5.12, and can't save ourselves. Many people don't want to hear the King, that the King James Bible is the only true Bible in English. They want to think that all English Bibles are God's word when they are Satan's counterfeits. Those Bibles will not allow people to rightly divide the Bible or come to the truth. God may save some by those uh, counterfeit Bibles, uh, but Many truths are corrupted in those Bibles. God's Secret has a good article in the appendix on um, 
you know, the Bible issue, which reminds me. Okay, so here is God's secret. This is the um, a book with pictures on how to rightly divide the word of truth. It gives you the basic foundational information that you need to have under your belt so there's no holes in your understanding. Then we also have Romans, a concise commentary, which goes through all the 16 chapters in Romans, and it also has a wonderful timeline of Christ's uh, ministry, his, all of it until he's beheaded. I mean, Paul's ministry, like Christ's ministry through Paul. Mm -hmm. So, and then we have 1 Corinthians, a commentary, and all of, um, so these first two are in color, so they're a little more expensive. Um, um, also, I want to mention that God's Secret, the, in the Kindle version, will be on sale for 99 cents from the 10th to the 17th of this month, August. Galatians, a commentary, and 1 Corinthians, those are in 2 Corinthians. Whoops, can I have 2 Corinthians? Mm -hmm. They um, are less. They're only $6.95, and this one's only $5.95. And then we have Treasure Hunt, which is commentary only without the uh, introductory information. Um, Romans to Philemon, and that's $8.95, and it has tons of pictures. And then we have Ephesians, which um, this is a picture of the heavenly places. And I want to thank you all for making uh, last month the biggest month in sales of the books. So we three times we've topped um, over 100 books in a month. Last month it was 140 books that were sold. And we thank you for supporting the ministry by buying our books on Amazon. So, let's get back. Um, <clears throat> we should be willing to suffer long with people telling them a little here and a little there and praying for them to have spiritual understanding. The fourth thing that Paul prays for is giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. It is God the Father that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, in Romans 8.32, so that we can have part of the inheritance in everything giving thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Notice that it says in everything, not for everything. So, you know, we can be thankful that we you know, have come to write the vision. We can be thankful that we have Christ in us when we're going through difficult circumstances. And we can be thankful that we have his word to calm us down, to give us the mind of Christ, and to remind us that we have, you know, this life is so short and we have eternity with Christ. We are grateful that we have a part in God's kingdom. God's kingdom contains the two realms, heaven and earth, um, and both places will contain saints and light. So, you know, the kingdom on earth, believers are saints and light, and so are we. Christ is the light of the world, as it says in John 8, 12. There is no salvation apart from being in Christ. Both groups of believers are in Christ, those in heaven and those on earth. The Father has made us fit to rule with Christ in heaven, the inheritance for the body of Christ while the rest of the saints, in prophecy, will inherit the earth. Patty, verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. So the purpose of this life is to decide where we will spend eternity. After that, it is to have done service of value to God when um, we are evaluated at the judgment seat of Christ. So once you're saved, then you can start working for God. Paul is thankful and said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believeth, in Romans 1.16. Every salvation is a big miracle as God translates us out of Adam, remember those pictures we had? Mm -hmm. Out of Adam into Christ. We're translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the 
his, the kingdom of his dear son. Um, now, every, uh, so it's a miracle when God's, th that God gets us out of Adam and into Christ, right? That's huge. It's a big miracle. And we don't know how he does that, but he does. Because, and how do we know? Because we just read the verse. <laughs> Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath strength translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. We mm -hmm. can read. The main reason why we want to read is so we can read his word. We just read and then we believe what we read. With, we understand it with our minds and we believe it with our hearts. And then it gets transferred from our mind into our heart so that we take on more information. Um, Lynn's here. Lynn's with your mom. here. Okay. With Yay. Paul is thankful. No, they'll, they'll come in. Don't worry. Okay. About okay. So, um, for in Adam all die. We were under bondage to Satan, the prince of the power of the air. Remember, that was our father before we were saved. And had his spirit. That makes it even yuckier. We had the spirit of Satan. When we were in in Adam, hi Ann, hi Lynn, hi Marianne, there. So hi, glad you could join us, hi, Cheryl. The, um, hi, well, okay, we're just going to continue because we have fifteen paper uh, pages to go through, and there's goodies on the back for you. Um, we were children of wrath, okay, and children of disobedience. Uh, actually, it should be children of disobedience first, and then children of wrath. But we were both. <laughs> we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We're in time past. He walked according to the course of this world. We were just flowing along with all that evil. According to the prince of the power of the air, you know, Satan, and the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Okay? That was a spirit working in us before salvation. Among whom also... Um, we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. So that's in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. We were doing all of those terrible things. We're in Colossians chapter 1, verse 14. Maureen? In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Christ has set us free from our enslavement to Satan through his blood. The price of salvation was costly to God, but a free gift to us. We who believe receive his imputed righteousness, the total forgiveness of sin, so we can stand before the Holy Father. Patty, verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Okay, so here, here is that firstborn of every creature. Mm -hmm. First, we're going to talk about how Christ is the image of the invisible God, and I'm going to refer to some other uh, you know, passages for that. So, in the next several verses, Paul gives a full-length portrait of the real Christ who became our Savior. Jesus Christ is, in fact, the second person of the Godhead that spoke creation into existence, Jehovah. By focusing on who Christ really is, the false doctrine that was trying to infiltrate Colossae pales, disintegrates, and is demolished in, a, in comparison. There are seven features to Paul's portrait of Christ. He is, one, the image of the invisible God. Two, the firstborn of every creature. He is the firstborn to, firstborn that replaced Adam is, is to receive the double portion, the true heir of creation. Three, the creator of uh, all things were created by him and for him. Four, he is before all things. Five, by him all things consist. Six, the head of the body, the church. And seven, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, in a glorified body. More are to come that will be raised in glorified eternal bodies in heaven and earth. But 
He was the, Christ was the very first one to have an eternal glorified body. No one else, people were raised from the dead, but no one else had a body that would never die again. For it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. Believers are in him. He created all things, and by him all things consist. He is not only the creator, but the sustainer. Paul counters the false doctrine with sound doctrine. And that's what we need to do. Remember, that's what Jesus did in the wilderness against Satan. When I took philosophy in high school, it didn't take me long, maybe two weeks, to figure out that Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates did not have any answers to life. So I asked to replace that class with another. Their philosophy gave the appearance in Colossae of super sanctification, but was in fact a cobweb of evil darkness. Um, in Colossians, we have true doctrine sharply silhouetted against the counterfeit. Because the result of the false doctrine was the deposing of and the subjection of Christ not his exaltation, supremacy, completeness, preeminence, and fullness. Christ is the exalted creator who existed before his creation, the firstborn from the dead in a glorious, incorruptible body. This error is prevalent in various churches today. Okay? So the mysticism that we're going to find out more about in the next chapter, it's in New Age philosophy and a lot of other uh, it has crept into many of the churches. When Jesus Christ put on human flesh, he became the image of the invisible God. Jesus told Philip, He that has seen me has seen the Father, John 14, 9, in whom the God of this world has blinded, we're talking about the image now, the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. That's 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. So Satan is trying to blind people from coming to the knowledge of truth or being saved. Who bringing in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had himself purged our sins, that was at the cross, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. That's Hebrews 1.3. So... Hebrews is speaking to who? Um, the scattered tribes. Yes, the Hebrews, right? Yeah. <laughs> Christ is the firstborn of, it's not the God, uh, body of Christ, yeah. of every creature in an eternal glorified body, never to die anymore. As it says in Philippians 3, 20 and 21, 1 Corinthians 15, 53, 54, and 2 Corinthians 5, 4. All creation is groaning, waiting for the restitution of all things to the perfection that existed before Adam and Eve disobeyed and sin entered the world. So creation was affected even though it was innocent. The, it, creation had not done anything wrong, but it was became, you know, sin. So... Um, Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain un together until now. Romans 3, 8, 21 and 22. So Lynn and Cheryl were both my assistants when I used to do home birth as a certified nurse home yeah, nurse midwife. Oh. And so Paul is now saying that all creation is like in birthing pains, <laughs> groaning and travailing, waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. Because God cannot restore everything until he knows who is going to be loyal to him. And remember we said that the Gentiles eventually will be able to eat from the tree of life. Mm -hmm. 
um, the Gentiles who are saved in prophecy. We are going to be raptured and get our glorified body in at the rapture, but you know that he he knows he needs to know all the people that are going to live in the new heaven and new earth. They have to all be identified before he can make everything right again. Okay, so uh, poor creation has to keep groaning, keep travailing. Uh, while on earth, Christ proved his power over creation. That he could overcome the curse by healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, casting out demons, and stilling the storm. After seeing the Lord on the road to Damascus, Paul's life was radically changed. Paul was consumed and captivated by a new love, Jesus Christ. And straightway he preached Christ in um, the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Acts 9.20 Paul explained that Jesus Christ was born in the lineage of David who um, was born in the lineage of David was raised in an incorruptible resurrected body in Acts 13.22 through 37 all the way back then when Paul first started talking he said that Christ was the uh, first born from the dead he declared and clarified here what he said there in Colossians 15 and Colossians uh, uh, 115 and 118. Christ is the firstborn from the dead, as Paul explained. Jesus Christ is the one that is begotten from the grave or resurrected by the Father in a glorified body in Psalm 2 7. So Psalm 2 7 says, I will declare. The decree, the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. That's um, so when God says, I have this day have I begotten thee, he's talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ because we found that out by Paul. And I think I have that a little later. Uh, but let's turn there. Let's go to um, Acts 13. Because this is um, so look with me in 13. 33. Acts 13, 33. God has fulfilled the same unto his us their children. In that he had okay, so he's saying here, God has fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he has raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second song, Thou art my son. This day have I gotten thee. So he, when he said raised up, that means resurrected. So Paul was the first one that was able to um, have spiritual understanding from the ascended Lord Jesus Christ to show that that's begotten there is actually talking about, about begotten from the dead. Okay? And see how he says, God hath fulfilled the same unto us. Us there is the body of Christ. Okay? So, he's showing that, um, you know, Christ, the son of David. Um, and by the way, the mercies of David means the Davidic covenant uh, that's going to be fulfilled when he, uh, Christ is king. So, many others have been raised from the dead to live again, but they all died again. Because they were not raised in an indestructible, glorious body never to die again like Christ. We will have our bodies at the rapture. The kingdom on earth believers will have theirs at Christ's second coming um, and when he sets up his 1,000 year reign. So his second coming is the era and then the 1,000 year reign. Um, as, as it says in Matthew 8.11 Let's turn, uh, turn to Matthew 8.11 who wants to read that? Who wants to read Matthew 8 11? I'll read it. Okay. <clears throat> read real loud, Alain, because your voice will be recorded. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So when the kingdom of heaven comes to earth, they're going to sit with, you know, Abraham. And, um, and Isaac and Jacob that will be resurrected 
Okay. Um, so they they get Jews get their glorified bodies, but not the Gentiles. Remember we talked about that. Mm. Um, but the Gentiles that are saved during the millennium will not have the opportunity of eternal life body until the new Jerusalem comes down in the new earth. Then they will eat of the tree of life that Adam and Eve were banned from and live forever. So there's the, the tree of life there. So it says in Revelation 22, 2, in the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manners of fruit and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So the nations there being the Gentiles. Revelation 22, 2. The tree of life is inside the new Jerusalem. Uh, verse 16, Maureen. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So Jesus Christ is the creator who spoke everything in heaven and on earth into existence. It was the second person of the Godhead that spoke and said, let there be light, and there was light. That's in Genesis um, 1. Um, Christ, the Word, is the main spokesman of the Godhead. Turn to 1 John 5, 7. Who wants, Patty, you want to read that? 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear a record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Okay, so we can see clearly from that word, uh, verse, um, that... Christ is the word that spoke. He's the second for, uh, he's, and that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost are one. Okay? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> he created the things that we can see and the things we cannot see. Because remember it said in that 16, visible and invisible? Mm -hmm. We can see the sky, the first heaven in the day. And we can see the planet, stars, moon, the second heaven at night. But we can't see the third heaven. Notice the plural nouns, thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. Because Christ has established governmental hierarchy in both heaven and earth. So Christ has a throne in heaven, and he has a throne on earth. All things were created by him and for him. All things were made by him and without him was nothing made that was made. John 1, 3. His wisdom is vast and beyond ours. Has thou not known, has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, L, capital O, capital R, capital D, which means Jehovah, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainted not, neither is weary, there is no searching of his understanding. Isaiah 40, 28. God put the Gentiles aside at the Tower of Babel, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator. Romans 1, 25. <clears throat> um, Patty, verse 17. Okay, Maureen, verse 17. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Christ existed before all things were created, and he is before all things. Christ is the everlasting God, mentioned in Micah 5.2, Psalm 90, 1 and 2, and 102, 25. Okay, let's go there. Uh, Patty, can you do Micah 5.2? Uh, Maureen, uh, Psalm 90... One and two. Do you want to pray, uh, read, Cheryl? No. Um, um, 
Lynn, you want to do 102, Psalm 102, 25? Psalm 102, 25. So, Patty, oh, oh, uh, you, ready. okay, tell no. me when you're ready. Okay. Or whoever's ready first. Who's got, oh, here's Micah. Okay, Micah 5 2. You're going to hurry. You just only have half an hour left. Does anyone have Micah? Psalm 102.25? Yeah, go ahead. You ready for that one? Yeah. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. Okay, so he, he laid the, the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. So he created, you know, it was his work. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Maureen. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Okay, so in other words, there was never a time when the Godhead was not three in one. Okay, do um, you have Micah 5 too? Mm -hmm. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is, to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from, been from the, of old, from everlasting. Okay, so the Lord Jesus Christ, who was born in Bethlehem, was from everlasting. Okay? So because we're talking about, in verse 17, that he is before all things, and by him all things consist. By him all things consist. He holds all things together. Have you ever thought about the fact that splitting one atom results in an atomic bomb? What power? All things exist because of Christ. And God said unto him, and Moses, unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent you. Exodus 3.14 Jesus said unto them, uh, while well, on earth, in his earthly ministry, Verily, verily, I say to, unto you, before Abraham was, I am. So Jesus Claim to be God, the Creator, because He was Jehovah God. Verse 18, Maureen. And He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. Paul clearly declares that Jesus is the head of the body, the church. Christ is the beginning, um, as it says in John 1, 1 through 4, and Proverbs 8, 22, and Hebrews 1, 10, and Revelation 22, 13. He was the first to rise from the dead in a glorified body. By Revelation, Paul explained in Psalm 2, 7, we got, went over this before, but here it is again, saying, the Father has begotten or resurrected his Son from the dead. God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus, again, as it is written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Acts 13, 33. As mentioned, Christ is before all things in 117. Biblically, the preeminence belonged to the firstborn of the family. The firstborn son received a double portion of the inheritance and double honor. For the firstborn, by giving him a double portion of all that he hath, for he is the beginning of his strength, the right of the firstborn is his. Reuben was the oldest, but he lost his birthright, which was given to Jacob's son Joseph, as mentioned in 1 Chronicles 5.1. Similarly, Adam lost his birthright to the last Adam. Christ is the firstborn of every creature. He is the firstborn that replaced Adam, and he is to receive the double portion, the true heir of creation. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of that, them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For in Adam all die, even so Christ shall be made alive. So all the progeny or descendants of Adam had no chance of eternal life. But because of Christ, 
We do. That was in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, and 23. So, so um, but every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after that, they that are his, that they that are Christ at his coming. So, um, when he comes, in the, for us, the body of Christ, and when he comes for Israel, um, at his second coming, they'll, they'll come out of their graves. As it says in Ezekiel. God will glorify his son. Also, I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. As it says in Psalm 89, 27. He was the first to have a glorified eternal body. He is firstborn of every creature and from the dead. He is the pre he has the preeminence. Christ has first place, the preeminence, or priority status in all things. He is being he being first to be resurrected means that there are more to follow. Uh, nineteen Patty? For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Good. Paul uses one of the heretics' terms, fullness, against them, saying that it pleased the Father that in the Son should all the fullness dwell. The Father wants Christ to be far above all the kingdom on earth, church, and the church in heaven. The theocratic governments in heaven and on earth. The Father raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So that's Ephesians 1, 20 through 23. That's uh, what, what the Church of Colossae was in danger of deviating from, that doctrine. Uh, verse 20, Maureen. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Okay, so notice he's making peace by his blood on the cross to reconcile all things to himself, unto himself, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So by the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ redeemed and reconciled all things to himself, whether things in earth or things in heaven. Now, in a minute, or in just a little while, I'm going to tell you about the four reconciliations, okay, in a very simple way that everyone's going to get it. His gigantic, all-satisfying, finished blood sacrifice of himself paid for the sins of all mankind, but only those in, the dispens in this dispensation who trust in his finished work on the cross and resurrection are reconciled to God. Because reconciliation is between two people. One person sticks out their hand, and the other person reaches for it and clasps it, and they shake. Okay, it takes two people to do a handshake. God did his part in Romans 5 8 and 8 32. So, but Christ demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the Father who spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all. So, um, the Father didn't spare his Son. And then our part is to believe, as it says in Romans 1 16. That um, and um, First Corinthians fifteen three and four. To reconcile means for two enemies to become friends. God is holding out His hand, waiting for people to shake it. Right now, in the dispensation of grace, the Father is holding out His hand to people. Many people think that they must win God over to them, but because of the cross work of Christ, the opposite is true. God is trying to win mankind over to him. In this dispensation, God is reconciled to mankind because of the blood of Christ. So now he's asking mankind to be reconciled to him. 
So here's the four reconciliations of God. Number one, Christ reconciled the believer to God, us to himself by Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.18. Number two, so, um, you know, the sinner have been reconciled to the Father, right? Believers have and the ministry of to reconcile others to God. So God hath given us the ministry of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians 5.18. And number three, the world to God in the dispensation of grace. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. So right now we're living in dispensation of grace where God is not imputing our trespasses against us. But we're not going to be forgiven unless we trust the finished work of Jesus Christ on the, his cross work. That's the way we, we get forgiven. God, okay, so number um, four. So that was 2 Corinthians 5.19, by the way. That um, he's Thank you. The reconciliation of the world unto himself. Okay? Number four. Now Paul says, to reconcile all things unto him, by him I, I say, that who's the I? Jesus. Paul. Oh, Paul. Paul, I say. Paul is the spokesman of Jesus Christ in the dispensation of grace, just like Moses was the spokesman during mm -hmm. prophecy, you know, in the law. I say, whether they be things on earth or things in heaven, meaning that there will be peace in his kingdom, in the new heaven and the new earth, when they're gathered into one in the fullness of time out here, when he makes, you know, the new heaven and new earth, there'll be peace between the believers in heaven and the believers on earth at that time. That's the fourth reconciliation, okay? Because he'll have only believers in heaven and earth at, at that time. Um, Patty, 21. And you, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. So now Paul's saying that, you know, you who were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works have now have not been reconciled to the Colossians. Before Paul was saved, we were called names. Okay? In time past, Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision Gentiles mm -hmm. by that which is called circumcision Jews mm -hmm. in the flesh made by hands that was a physical circumcision that at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world but now in Christ Jesus Ye who were sometimes far off have been made nigh by the blood of Christ. So, back here, there was a separation between the circumcision, who was God's preferred nation of Israel, and the uncircumcision, which was the Gentiles. But now, because Israel fell when they committed the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost by stoning Stephen, and they have fallen down now, and there's no distinction between any persons um, in the dispensation of grace, as we will find out when we, in um, Ephesians, I mean Colossians 3:11. The middle wall of partition, the separation between Jews and Gentiles, because the Jews were God's preferred nation, given the token of physical circumcision and dietary law and other laws, is broken down. Christ has reconciled Jews and Gentiles in the dispensation of grace, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Okay, see, see that the Jews called us uncircumcised Philistines, right? Mm -hmm. And they were circumcised because, you know, God preferred them. So um, he's abolished that enmity in his, in, in his body on the cross having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments. What were those commandments? You know, the token of circumcision, the dietary laws, and the um, contained in the ordinances. So that was physical circumcision and dietary laws, right? Don't eat pork. For to make in himself 
of twain, Jews and Gentiles, one new man, the body of Christ. So making peace. So he's now formed the body of Christ. So anyone who believes the gospel of Christ will go into the body of Christ that will live in heaven. And the rest of the people in the white will live on earth, in the earthly kingdom. So, um, creation is waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. In the millennium, creation will be restored, and the trees will clap their hands. Okay? The trees will clap their hands, because remember, they were travailing like a woman in labor. Once creation is re restored, the trees will be happy. That's in Isaiah 55:12. And new earth, new um, and creation will be renovated. Uh, verse 22, Maureen. In the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Christ died and reconciled the body of Christ. All distinctions have been done away. What matters is faith in what Christ has done. He was our substitute, dying in our place, so that we could have his righteousness imputed to us in 2 Corinthians 5.21. This is how we can be unblameable and unreprovable. Unreprovable means unaccusable or unchargeable in God's sight. God is the one who justifies us, declared us. Um, justified us and declared us right who can bring a charge against us but now not once one God has justified us there's no one that can unjustify us but it was all what Christ, Jesus Christ did and nothing of what we did salvation is a hundred percent God and zero percent what we did to think anything else is to insult God and to make our faith of none effect God will not accept you if you think you have any part in your own salvation it's an insult to god because christ did it all unless you understand that you are probably undermining what you think is your salvation that's very clear in romans 4 5 and 14. Uh, verse 23 whose turn is it patty if ye continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Paul encourages us to continue in his doctrine. We cannot lose our salvation. Once we're saved, God is not going to take us out of the body of Christ that we were baptized into in 1 Corinthians 12.13. However, people who don't keep the faith, see how it says the faith in that, that verse? Mm -hmm. the, faith the faith that Christ from heaven gave to us through Paul will not function as God intended them to in this life or know what the Father is doing so they can be useful sons and daughters to him. They'll, they'll be saved, but they'll be unuseful to God. Unless they're following Paul. We need to be grounded and settled in our understanding of the mystery. Reading God's secret has helped many. Paul doesn't want anyone to be moved away from the sound doctrine he is ministering. Because he knows that the word of God that he preaches will do the work of God in the believers. It is amazing to hear that one apostle with help had preached so that the entire Roman Empire of his day had heard that Christ died for our sins and was offering salvation freely to anyone who would believe so they could live in heaven, not in the earthly kingdom. Verse 24, Marie. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. So Christ suffered for the salvation of the church, but Paul suffered to make the salvation known. Remember, he had all those, you know, stripes, he had the shipwrecks, he had, you know, he suffered a lot to get the message to us and build the body of Christ. 
Christ had told Paul that he would suffer for his sake, and now Paul rejoices that he can serve Christ, um, help him build the body of Christ, and suffer what is left over of Christ's suffering for his body's sake, which is the church. Patty, 25. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Okay. Jesus Christ made Paul his minister in Acts 29, I mean 26, 16. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. That's in Romans 15, 16. The dispensation of God that was just mentioned in this verse is the same as the dispensation of the grace of God. Mentioned in Ephesians 3 2. God gave Paul the assignment to fulfill, which means finish or complete the word of God. When Paul laid down his pen after writing 2 Timothy, then the Bible was complete. Inspiration ceased. There is no new revelation from God today. He has said everything we need to know in the Bible. Now it's up to us to study it and learn what he has said and believe his word. This is how we grow, how we are sanctified. God is dispensing grace and peace to anyone who will trust his son's work on the cross and resurrection. Patty 26. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Okay, notice something was hid, but now it's made manifest or revealed. The mystery is no longer a mystery. It was hid from ages and from generation, but now, since Paul's salvation on the road to Damascus in Acts 9, okay, there is so much confusion today between Peter and Paul. Most of Christendom is worshiping the wrong apostle. They're worshiping Peter instead of Paul. So, since Paul's salvation on the road to Damascus in Acts 9, it has been made known, this mystery. God decided to form the body of Christ before the foundations of the world. Remember I had that little triangle out there? Um, <clears throat> so, it says in, in uh, Ephesians 1, 4, yeah, before the foundation of the world, the form formation of the body of Christ in the dispensation of grace to live in the heavenly places was kept secret since the world began, as it says in Romans 16, 25. It was not made known until Paul was saved, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it says in Ephesians 3, 5. The mystery was not mentioned anywhere in the Bible until Paul. He said, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3, 8 and 9. Paul received the mystery from Christ in heaven, and now describes what had been hid in God. Actually, Paul, the chief of the stewards of the mystery, 1 Corinthians 4, 1, now speaks of a threefold mystery here in Colossians. Number one, the church, the body of Christ, in verses 24 through 26, and number two, the indwelling of Christ, in verse 27, and three, of God and the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, the fullness of the Godhead bodily, as we will see in chapter 2, verses 2, 3, and 9. Uh, Maureen, 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Savior, Creator, by whom all things consist, indwells the believer. This is a jaw-dropping truth that Satan doesn't want us to know. Christ in you, the hope of glory. His spirit in us is a guarantee that we will be part of the Father's glory plan to exalt his Son 
in heaven and on earth. Turn to Romans 8, 9. Uh, Lynn, you want to read that? Okay. Romans 8, 9. The earthly kingdom believers will have his spirit in them also, as it says in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, and Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. Are you ready? Uh, Romans 8, 9. Mm -hmm. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of this. None of his. Okay, so if someone's professing to be a Christian and they don't have the spirit of Jesus Christ in them, they're not going to be going up at the rapture. But the good news is we're still alive and we can make sure that we're going up in the rapture, okay, and that we have the spirit of Christ in us because faith comes cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So if someone is alive, they can find out for sure. So... How could the Colossians turn away from or add to the glorious sevenfold salvation brought to pass through his son? I'm going to go over the sevenfold salvation right now. Number one, inheritance. Partakers of the inheritance in the saints. Verse 112. Two, deliverance. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness? Verse 13. Two, uh, three, translated. And hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Four, redemption, in whom we have the redemption through his blood, verse 14. Five, forgiveness, even the forgiveness of sins, verse 14. Six, reconciliation, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled, that's verse 21. Seven, imputation, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Verse 22. So you can see how incredible Colossians chapter 1 is. And how incredible Paul's argument is. But we're going to find out in the next few verses who's helping Paul. Verse 28. Is it your turn, Patty? Or is it uh, yours, Maureen? Mm -hmm. Who, whose turn is it? Patty, go ahead. Okay. Uh, what was it? Uh, 28. 28. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Okay. So, Paul is preaching Jesus Christ and he's warning every man to trust in him. And he's also warning every man to believe the doctrine that Jesus Christ from heaven gave to him and not to think that the earth, Christ's earthly ministry in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John pertain to them. Because it doesn't. We are following Christ's heavenly ministry in Romans to Philemon. That's what belongs to us in the body of Christ because we're going to live in the heavenly places. Okay. So he now wants that they may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So we're going to look into what that means because God wants us to be sanctified. He wants us to know this information that I'm sharing with you today. The last verse said that Christ is in us. While this verse, okay, that was 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Mm -hmm. So this verse says to present every man perfect in, in Christ Jesus. So, now we have, uh, it says that we're in Christ. So, Christ is in us, and we're in Christ, right? Even in prophecy, the saints will be in Christ, and Christ will be in them. Turn to um, John 17, 21 through 26. Okay, I'll read that. That ye may be one. This is Christ, uh, prayer, the true prayer of Christ for his disciples. That ye may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, 
and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am and that they may be hold my glory which thou hast given me for thou lovest me before the foundations of the world O righteous father the world has not known thee but I have known thee and these have known that thou art that thou hast sent me and I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it that the love wherein with thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them Okay, so when we have Christ's spirit in us, we have Christ's love in us. And we have, you know, uh, his love for, for um, we have Christ, we have the love for God, and we have the love for man, kind. So, um, Paul and his friends were preaching Christ, warning every man not to reject him. They taught every man in all wisdom about Christ's ministry through Paul as mentioned in Ephesians 3, 1 through 9. They were teaching them the sound words that Christ had given them through Paul in his letters so that all the sound doctrine could help them grow and mature uh, to a mature understanding of what um, the mystery of Christ was. Paul wants the believers to be as mature as possible before they are raptured. Um, our rapture is mentioned in Titus 2.13 and 1 Thessalonians 4.16 and 17. We know that God wants the perfecting or, ma of, or mature intelligent understanding of his word by his saints. Paul wants Christ and him to be proud of us at the judgment seat of Christ. Because that's our next stop after the rapture, is the judgment seat of Christ for service. Um, 29, Marie. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. To present every man perfect in Christ Jesus is the goal Paul strives for, according to Christ working in him mightily. God is not inter Okay, so see there? This last verse, it says, Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his work, which worketh uh, his working which worketh in me mightily so Christ is working mightily in Paul okay um, to present every man perfect that's what he wants spiritual maturity spiritual maturity spiritual um, rightly dividing the word truth has to happen in, for us to understand God's word um, so he's, he's got Christ working in him mightily God is not intervening physically in our lives by signs. God is not communicating audibly with any believer today. We need to divide Paul's writing to us from the rest of the Bible. God only communicates with us in one way today, through the words written down on the pages of the King James Bible, rightly divided. God's instructions to us is found in Paul's writings, Romans to Philemon, it is true that Paul did perform miracles in the beginning of his ministry because if he hadn't, the twelve never would have believed that Christ sent Paul. The Jews require a sign, as it says in 1 Corinthians 1.22. Once Paul received the full revelation of the mystery from Christ, Paul's healing, tongues, and miracles ceased because they were no longer needed. As Paul said that they would cease in 1 Corinthians um, 13, 8 through 13. Um, there are no more of those kinds of spiritual gifts recorded by Paul after he were, um, arrived in Rome. Um, let's read uh, Romans 15, 29. Um, Maureen, you want to read that? And then, Patty, you can read uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.13 in a minute. And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. 
Okay, so Paul was sure that when he arrived in Rome, he would come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. So he believed that he was going to have the understanding of the mystery by the time he arrived in Rome. So supernatural spiritual tongues, healings, and miracles are not part of the dispensation of grace. Christ is working in Paul and us through his spirit in our inner man, helping us to have spiritual understanding of his word. That's how God is working now spiritually in the believer to manifest himself to the, to the rest of the same time. So, uh, tongues and healings and those things died out during Paul's lifetime, which was, you know, nearly 2,000 years ago. Uh, Patty, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this cause also I uh, also thank we God without ceasing, because when we received the word of God, when ye, when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Okay, so today for, for a believer to... Be useful to God, they have to have the Word of God working effectually in them that belongs to them. So they have to have Paul's 13 epistles, an understanding of that, working in them to be useful sons and daughters to God, and then um, they will have something at the judgment seat of Christ. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father God, in Jesus' name, we come before you, and we just thank you so much for um, this opportunity to look into your word in the King James Bible, rightly divided. And we pray that this um, Bible study today will be a great benefit for edifying your saints, that they may be um, stabilized and advanced in their understanding of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bye.